Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues in today's headlines that impact every American. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, and I'm here to educate, motivate, and activate you to action. I want to arm you with the truth and the facts you'll need to fight and preserve our constitutional republic and uphold the Judeo-Christian values our nation was founded upon. Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues from today's headlines that impact every American, Jew and Christian, people of faith and people of conscience. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore. On today's program, I've invited Dr. David Patterson to discuss Holocaust revisionism in the age of rising anti Semitism. If you missed last week's podcast, you will find it in our previous podcast lineup on our website at pjtn.org. I also want to remind you to listen and share this and our previous podcasts with your family and friends so that they will become more informed about this and other related issues to equip you to take back local control of your community and your children's and grandchildren's education. Dr. David Patterson holds the Hillel A. Feinberg Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies. University of Texas at Dallas, and is a senior research fellow for the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy. He is a commissioner on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission and a member of the executive board of the Annual Scholars Conference on the Holocaust and the Churches. He has lectured at universities on six continents and throughout the United States. A winner of the National Jewish Book Award, the Coret Jewish Book Award, and the Holocaust Scholars Conference Eternal Flame Award. He has published 40 books and more than 240 articles, essays, and book chapters on topics in literature, philosophy, the Holocaust, and Jewish studies. His most recent books are Judaism, Antisemitism, Holocaust, Reflections on Connections, Shoah and Torah, Portraits, Ellie Wiesel's Hasidic Legacy, The Holocaust and The Non-Representable, and Anti-Semitism and Its Metaphysical Origins. Dr. Patterson, it is a great honor. Welcome to Proclaiming Justice. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me to to be here with you. Sir, the honor is truly ours. You've done an incredible job um, in research, and I've been following the work that you do, and we are so honored to have you um, on our program today. So today we're going to discuss today's topic about Holocaust revisionism in the age of rising anti-Semitism. And more and more information is being uncovered about these issues, and you've spent a lot of time researching this growing threat. So let's let's talk about Holocaust revisionism. What is it and why should we be concerned about it? Well, Holocaust revisionism uh, is not rooted in historical evidence. You know, I have many of my students say, how can anyone think this didn't happen or it wasn't as bad or or other forms of revisionism claim that the Jews are behind it, right? So my answer is that it's not about history, it's about Jew hatred. Uh, It's about removing the Jews from the Holocaust. It's about de-Judaizing the Holocaust. Uh, And it's promoted in, in many quarters precisely by the ones who would love to see the Holocaust happen again. Uh, But the reason, I think one reason for the revisionism, I mean, people say, well, yeah, it happened, but uh, is, is the following, namely that what were the Nazis trying to obliterate in the annihilation of the Jews? They're trying to obliterate a millennial testimony of the Jews that includes 
uh, bearing witness to the infinite responsibility that we have to the other human being, Jewish, non-Jewish, uh, especially the stranger, as the Torah teaches us, because the other human being is, is a child of God, is a child of Adam, um, bears the image and likeness of the Holy One, and that holiness is infinite and brings upon us an infinite responsibility that, like, like Adam, we tend to hide from. Uh, so I think that is a lot of what's what drives Holocaust revisionism. Very good. You know, in 2018, former Spanish River High School principal William Latson was fired from his job by the Palm Beach County School Board for telling a parent, quote, not everyone believes the Holocaust happened. This is shocking coming from an educator who is responsible for ensuring that state law and education standards are taught and in compliance in state schools. In fact, that same year, Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill into law adopting a definition of anti-Semitism of, of which William Latson violated by making that claim. This is shocking. How pervasive is this Holocaust revisionism by educators like this former principal in your estimation? It's, it's pervasive not only among uh, educators in the, in the public sector. Uh, I mean, who who wants to believe that it happened? It's it, to engage it is traumatizing. No one can engage the subject matter and walk away innocent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not just the educator; it's the scholars. Many scholars flee from it. I can, if I can tell you a story about a friend of mine was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, she, she was a, a scholar of Russian literature, but she wrote a memoir. She went to a, a, a scholar, a, one, you know, a conference on the Holocaust hosted by scholars. She and I sat through a, a plenary session. And when we walked out, she said to me, now I know what they, the scholars, want us, the survivors, to do. Now I know what they want us to do. They want us to die. Mm. And the next time I saw Ellie Wiesel, I shared this shocking story mm. with him. And he, sm he, he had that sad smile of his. And he said, of course. And then he paused and said, but we'll die. We will. They just have to be patient. Mm. So it's it because of the traumatizing nature of the of the subject matter, we 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 flee from it, we water it down, and ultimately we de judaize it. So how do we solve the problem, Doctor Patterson? I mean, this is that's frightening to hear such a statement. We well, uh, resolving it requires not only extensive study. Uh, but a, a measure of courage. Um, to study the Holocaust entails, you know, studying uh, the questions that, that God puts to Cain, engaging those questions. Where is your brother? Mm. And what have you done? And none of us can walk away unsullied from, from that engagement because because our, our fellow human being is infinitely dear, we can never quite meet the responsibility. Uh, so the Holocaust summons us to that reckoning. And uh, most of us don't want to be called to such a reckoning. Unfortunately, I believe that is very true. And we see the evidence of that within our society People don't want to get involved. They don't want to be held accountable. You know, uh, journalist Jeff Jacoby with the Boston Globe recently reported on a study that was published by the Conference on Jewish Materials Claims Against Germany that in a survey conducted of basic Holocaust knowledge among Americans under 40 concluded a worrying lack of basic Holocaust knowledge 
For example, 63% of millennials and Gen Zers did not know that 6 million Jews were murdered by Nazi Germany. 48% couldn't identify a concentration camp, a ghetto, or an extermination site. And 22% weren't sure if they had ever heard about the Holocaust. This is shocking. In, a, in, a, in an age when there is so much information available out there, how can this happen? How can we, um, we've got, you know, hol- Holocaust education and we've got the evidence of history. You know, it, re- it reminds me, Dr. Patterson, of the comments that were made by um, Dwight D. Eisenhower when he told everybody when they were liberating the concentration camps to get document everything you see here because someday some his term bastard is going to come along and say this didn't happen. Yes. Uh, well, I think in, in the case of the youth, uh, the fault doesn't really lie with them. It lies with people like me, with us, with the educators. Uh, teaching is testimony. Teaching requires listening. Teaching requires standing for something when you stand before a class. And nothing like a course on the Holocaust demands that more more profoundly. Um, And I I teach uh, uh, courses on the Holocaust uh, every semester at the University of Texas, at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, which is really the premier center for Holocaust studies. We have five endowed chairs in Holocaust studies. No place in the world has that. So one of the ways I, you know, introduce that class is I'll I'll share with my students a statement I heard once in a film when one one, uh, film, you know, uh, set during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany and a child asks a Jew who's hiding, why do they hate Jews? And he said, because we remind them of their humanity. Mm. I think that's why we, in, in our educational endeavor, we, we tend to de-Judaize, trivialize, and otherwise water down the study because it reminds us of our humanity. And then I'll ask them, why would you hate someone for ri- reminding you of your humanity? Uh, and I think it goes back to this question of being asked, you know, where are you? First question put to the first human. Mm-hmm. Brother, what have you done? It, it goes to the, the, the core of responsibility. If I can say one more thing about education, what does it mean? In Hebrew, the word for education is chinuch, which also means sanctification. Hmm. Not just a matter of gathering information or learning the facts of history, which, I mean, which that's indispensable. But what do you do with what you learn? Uh, you, you, we, we, each of us is called to the stand. Mm-hmm to sanctify life. And in, in, in the Holocaust, that is precisely what was targeted for extermination, that testimony to the sanctity of the other human being, that the Jews represent by their very presence in the world and that the Nazis are trying to eliminate. Mm. Now, so the question is, are we gonna become accomplices to that project of eliminating that testimony? Good question. You know, surprisingly, Jacoby reported that some of the lowest scoring states were ones that required Holocaust education for decades. So how can this be? How can this happen? If these are states that are educating about the the Holocaust and have been for decades, why the lack of, of understanding and knowledge? Well, for the reasons you've suggested already, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. I was on the Tennessee Holocaust Commission, and, and the, the, you know, and the mission of the commission is education primarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that it's 
that Holocaust education is mandated doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, it has to be engaged in with vigilance and, and discussion. When I say vigilance, I'm not saying you got to enforce this way or, or, or no way. No, we, we're, and there's, there's always disagreement when, on this topic of how to go about teaching the Holocaust. Um, but the, the, the disagreement is productive when, it's, when it takes place in good faith. Mm -hmm. is, what exactly is the anti-Semite anti anyway? Mm -hmm. What exactly are the Nazis trying to annihilate here? What does it mean? Um, what does it mean about how we understand ourselves as human beings? You know, Elie Wiesel said that at Auschwitz, not only man died, but the very idea of man, the very idea of a human being. Mm -hmm. Holocaust education is about restoring the idea, the sanctity, the dearness, the responsibility of the human being. Without responsibility, we have no humanity. We have none. Mm. Uh, and, and when we engage the Holocaust, understanding that means engaging the millennial teaching and testimony of the Jewish people, the history of the Jewish people, the tenets of Judaism, which the Nazis set out to obliterate, as they said, right? Alfred Rose the chief ideologue of National Socialism said that that the Aryan spirit is poisoned not just by Jewish blood but by Judaism. Okay, so what do how do we understand what that means? We have to, in our study of the Holocaust, understand what Judaism is and what it means, what it teaches over the centuries. So we have a problem with educators and being informed. And teaching and how much teaching um, goes on in these schools in these states, because it's my understanding 17 states across the United States have some law requiring that the Holocaust be taught. And of course, I haven't looked at their standards to see the, the totality of what is required. But one of the things that I'm concerned about, and you could probably elaborate on this, is that the in these states where where Holocaust education is required to be taught, and even if they have some semblance of standards, whatever they are, are the teachers qualified to be able to teach the subject matter in a way that um, is accurate? Because if we think about it, the study that I mentioned that Jeff Jacoby had um, cited, that a lot of these, um, these educators are not informed or versed, um, and, and the educators all, this is 40 and under, and most of our schools of higher learning with education uh, schools programs, are they teaching this subject matter in these states where Holocaust education is required? Well, that's, that's part of the tremendous challenge here. I've, I've been involved for many years in uh, teacher workshops, teacher education. Uh, in, in my experience, of course, the, those, those teachers are self-selected who attend the workshop, okay? And in my experience, they want to know. They want to talk. They want to study. They want to learn. Uh, and invariably, they come from their own college training with little to no training in this subject matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we're, we have to... I think, have some empathy and sympathy for the teachers. I mean, they're being asked to do something that many of them, and they know, are not prepared to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, give us the lesson plan, and, they, and 
in this subject matter that in which you've never had a course and you've never been asked to study it. So uh, that's a systemic issue. Mm -hmm. Again, in my experience, the teachers are, are acting in good faith. They're not saying, I don't want to teach that. No, they're saying, please help me teach that. So I have, I have immense respect for teachers uh, in the public schools. Uh, you know, I, I was once a teacher in the public schools myself, and it drove me back to graduate school so I could teach college. But they, they have a huge job, uh, and we should be thankful for them. But we also need to provide them with more resources than just uh, web links on a website. We, we need, in, when they go through the universities and colleges, they, they should uh, have available to them some kind of coursework on the Holocaust. You know, I have a, a very dear friend who is a Catholic theologian in Belgium at the Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium, outside of Brussels. And uh, for some years, he was the, the dean of the theology faculty. And he made, a, uh, uh, at least as a minimum, a semester on the Holocaust, a requirement for people earning a degree in theology at the Catholic University in Leuven. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a model that we could follow in colleges of education, certainly where there are states that have this as a mandate. Okay, it's it's a course. And let me add one more thing. For my students uh, who take a course on the Holocaust, it's not it isn't required. Um, you know, for the undergraduates, the graduates have to take courses on it if they want the certification. Mm -hmm. But for them, it, it's it's one place where they can engage the meaning of for proclaim justice, the meaning of justice, mm -hmm. meaning of truth, the meaning of life, and they hunger for that. We live in what I call a meaning famine. Uh, not just for not just for young adults and and, and teens, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. The soul needs meaning, like the body needs bread. So this is one class where we can get together and discuss what matters, what there is to love, why we live, why we die, and how that can come under a, a radical assault. How fragile it is. Therefore. Uh, I don't, you know, asking people in education programs to take a course on the Holocaust might might give them a reason for understanding the meaning of the of the whole endeavor of, of, of education and learning might help them as it helps my students. And they tell me to understand what's higher, what is higher in higher learning. Wow. Good point. Good point. I'd like to move to another issue with regards to Holocaust revisionism. In 2019, PJTN published a white paper titled Indoctrination in U.S. Public Education, the Dismantling of Our Constitutional Republic. This document is available on our website at pjtn.org. But in our research, we found that Holocaust revisionism is being subtly applied by educators who intentionally water down the history of the Holocaust by connecting it with other groups, other isms. Can you explain to our audience this movement and how it applies to the term critical race theory, which is running rampant on K through 12 campuses? Um, boy, Lori, that's a big question. Okay. Um, yes, uh, th there is a part of the, the, the tendency to de-Judaize de the Holocaust entails throwing the Jews in a Holocaust of its intellectual and moral demands. Uh, with the advent of critical race theory, it, we have the, the rise of something that plays into the hands of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Jews, 
in their history, their tradition, their testimony, attest to a view of a human being that is antithetical to race. Uh, every We all come from one human being. The God begins with one human being, we're taught, with Adam, so that no one can say to another, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. There's only one side of the family. We're all bound to one another through Adam, physically, biologically, and we're bound to God, the creator, spiritually. Okay. Uh, critical race theory undermines that bond, in my view. Uh, wherever you see race as a first principle, in other words, wherever you see race established as the, the, the starting point for your understanding of reality, humanity, uh, human interaction, when race is the first principle, then you have a legitimization of racism, which always come, brings with it anti-Semitism. See, the Nazis were not anti-Semites because they were racist. They were racist because they were anti-Semites. Uh, I, I think, in, in my view, critical race theory, in, in as much as it takes race to be the foundation of everything, has to be anti-Semitic because it has to oppose this anti, not just anti-racist, but anti-race view of humanity that we have from the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you um, the ethnic studies model curriculum that we're seeing in California, it's coming out of California, they have been able, <clears throat> excuse me, to separate the Jews, to make the Jews, this is all part of the whole critical race theory, again, agenda, but they have stated that Jews of Arab descent, because they are Jews of color, um, are, uh, are taught in this ethnic studies model curriculum. However, they leave out the European white Ashkenazi Jews. And this, to me, is extremely problematic. And of course, it's, it's frightening to see that it's not just being used in California. This, this concept is being adopted all over the country. It's something that I'd like for you to explain or talk about is this division of the Jew. Do you find this as a threat to white Ashkenazi Jews? by separating them and not including them in an ethnic studies curriculum? It's a threat not only to white Ashkenazi Jews, but to all Jews. Uh, it is anti an, uh, an anti-Semitic move. The Jews, first of all, the Jews are not a race. Jews come in all colors. I know you've been to Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, all you have to do is walk a block in Jerusalem and you see Jews of every description, of every color, from every continent, every culture. More than 100 languages are spoken within the borders of that small country. It's spoken by Jews. All, and, of course, within the borders of Israel, you, there are more than a million and a half non-Jewish citizens, Israelis. So Israelis are not a race, Jews are not a race. And as soon as you separate out Jews by color, you buy into uh, an anti-Semitic racist point of view. But, but here's the problem. It's a fashionable form of racism. It's even a morally required form of racism. Uh, it, it it has implications for how we understand the 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 so-called Arab-Israeli conflict. It has implications for anti-Zionist movements, such as BDS, you know, boycott, divest, sanction. 
which itself is is deeply anti-Semitic. So here, in the guise of accommodating Jews, you have, in the end, the promotion of Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's deeply troubling. When I saw that they were separating out the Jews, I saw it as a way for them to easily say when they're being accused of being anti-Semitic and the curriculum is anti-Semitic, they're going to say, no, 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 see, we got Jews. We got Jews of color. We're not anti-Semitic, but the white Ashkenazi Jews, well, let's put them into the white privilege category. The ghetto of white privilege. This yeah. is the this is this is a ghetto ghettoization of a segment of the Jews that follows a pattern of delegitimizing uh, and and in, in many cases demonizing the Jews, just as the the Jewish state is consistently demonized. And once again, it it it. it makes this form of anti-Semitism something that's morally required. If Israel is an apartheid state, if it's a state guilty of crimes against humanity, if it's a racist state, what then is morally required? It has to be dismantled, has to be eliminated, right? So uh, this, this, there's something even more insidious about this move of separating out the Ashkenazi Jews. That's not, Jews, they're not separate. They, they, they embrace the same Torah, the Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Arab Jews, the Beta Yisrael, the Mizrahi Jews, all of, they all embrace the Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. They, all embrace, attest to the same Torah that makes them Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made a great point. Um, you know, you had made a statement, you're on record as stating that the term Holocaust does not refer to every evil perpetrated by the Nazis between 1933 and 1945. It was the annihilation of the Jews, the final solution to the Jewish question. And you stated that that question was not the gypsy question or the communist question or the handicapped question or the homosexual question. The Nazis called it the war against the Jews. Explain what you were referring. Well, I'm, that's the definition of the Holocaust. I mean, the, the Germans... Uh, call it, among other things, the Judenvernichtung, which means the annihilation of the Jews. Uh, it's also called Churban in Yiddish, which is uh, devastation, destruction. And, and it's, uh, it's a word used to talk about the destruction of the two temples. Mm. Uh, some Jews refer to the Holocaust as a third Churban. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the temple? The temple signifies God's presence in the world. The Nazis are trying to obliterate Judaism, as I suggested earlier, and the obliteration of the Jews. There's no gypsyism or handicapism. There's no tradition of holy texts and teachings attached to these other groups. Now, mm -hmm. having said that, as Elie Wiesel once said, what begins with the Jews doesn't end with the Jews. Why not? Why not? Because the Jews represent, as I've said, a, 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 a millennial testimony to the sanctity of every human being, every child of God. I mean, the, the word for human being in Hebrew is ben Adam, which is child of Adam. Uh, again, we're all one family. That's why it doesn't end with the Jews. It extends to the rest of the human family. Um, the Nazis were trying to render the world Juden Rhein, mm -hmm. which means purified of the Jews, purified of Judaism, purified of the millennial tradition that the Jews represent by their presence in the world. There's no equivalent word attached to Jew, uh, gypsies, communists, handicapped homosexuals. And there's no Rhein purification mm -hmm. attached to that. And so, the, in 1943, the Nazis went to the Arctic 
to the town of Tromso in Norway, 220 miles north of the Arctic Circle, because there were 17 Jews there, not because there were 17 handicapped there. They went there to, to take, kill the Jews and take the Jews. They sent them to Auschwitz. Uh, and that, t which, what tells us what? It tells us that the, the, the extermination of the Jews was not reducible to a case of scapegoating or xenophobia or, or economic envy. You don't have to go to the Arctic for that. It's, it's a project to kill the God of Abraham, as the Nazis themselves said, and it has to be as ubiquitous as God himself is. Mm. That's why they go to Tromsø. It's frightening to think about that they targeted a group of people a few hundred miles north of them, and they couldn't, they weren't satisfied with just killing the Jews in Europe or in Germany as they started. But it just goes to show how horrific they these Nazis were and their goal. And, you know, you never really think that Nazism and the goal to annihilate the Jews was really to annihilate the God of the Jews, to target the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, yes. it's, it's frightening to see you know, to hear that and to unfortunately see the lack of um, education in our generation and generations, you know, since the Holocaust, even during the Holocaust, while the Holocaust was going on, the lack of people who were willing and countries, governments that were unwilling to, to get involved and were delayed. I mean, here, even in the United States, we had ship that was wanting to to dock in one of our ports on the east coast and we wouldn't even allow them yeah. to the come Saint in louis, yes. the st louis i'm sorry the st louis yes. we weren't even willing to allow them to come in to give them a safe haven and it's it's it is a frightening testimony to humanity and we look at our world and what's happening today and are we are we like those people in Germany and throughout Europe who turned a blind eye when we watched well, anti-Semitism? As you say, it is global. Um, today, there, there's because we have a Jewish state, thank God, uh, the, the Jews aren't on ships trying to find safe haven. They have safe haven in the state, but even the Jewish state is a kind of ship among the nations. The mm -hmm. Jewish state is the Jew among the nations, and it is the target of exterminationist anti-Semitism, and not just from Iran. I mean, Iran's stated goal and mission and even now, legislated goal, after the, as of about two months ago, is the ex extermination of the Jewish state. Uh, in 2020, the United Nations passed 17 sanctions, resolutions against the Jewish state. They passed six against the other 192 members combined, uh, what does that tell you? Mm. I mean, you want to think, yeah. really? Uh, are there no other countries that might invite sanctions besides mm -hmm. Israel? Almost three times as many for one state over against the other 192. Mm -hmm. So that's, Israel is the St. Louis now. And, uh, it, it's incumbent upon us, and, and thank God for it, organizations like Proclaim Justice to the Nations to provide a harbor, a haven for Israel, uh, someplace they can turn and find witnesses mm -hmm. uh, to, to attest to 
the 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 Jew hatred everywhere, especially the what I call the fashionable and morally required Jew hatred in our own time. Right. Well, I appreciate those kind words. We look at the work that we do here at PJTN as holy work that God has called us to. And we've been fortunate to have you and your scholarly wisdom and advice in assisting us through that process. As you know, we're working on the final draft of the Holocaust standards in the state of Florida. And um, something I, I want to bring up for our audience before we um, start coming to a close, bring this program to, the, to a close, is the fact that we have to teach the, you know, Hitler, when he came to power and the Nazis came to power in Ger Germany, it wasn't just a one-off incident. It wasn't something after, you know, uh, 6,000 years or, you know, 4,000 years of, of, of human beings inhabiting the earth that somebody decided to go after the Jews. This is um, part of historically what we have seen throughout history for over 3,000 years. We saw it with, um, with King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in Spain and Portugal with the Inquisition. Um, we saw it with Haman in Persia, and we saw it, of course, in Egypt with Pharaoh. So, you know, it's critically important that when we're teaching our children about the Holocaust, that it wasn't, it didn't happen in a vacuum. There were, there were generations, centuries of Holoc of persecution. There was the pogroms throughout um, the ages that have been um, lobbed against the Jews. And unfortunately, you know, we have groups well intentioned. I will will say that think that it, including that type of information in standards to teach our children about Holocaust education in our K through 12 classrooms is critically important. And to, to suggest that incorporating, even using the term Zionism in those standards, um, you know, should be removed, that it shouldn't be and that using the term Zionism is, um, is taking the Holocaust outside of its historical context. Do you agree? I do. Uh, I mean, it reminds me of turning away the St. Louis. I mean, what is Zionism anyway? Zionism was a movement to provide a haven for the Jews. Uh, established uh, the first Zionist Congress in 1897 by Theodore Herzl, who came to the conclusion that as long as the Jews are guests in somebody else's house, as he put it, they would not be safe. So, Zionism is is similar to the St. Louis. It's they 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 set out on a journey to find a haven, create a heaven, establish a haven for the Jews in the ancient Jewish homeland, and it has everything to do with the Holocaust. It's part of an, the essential context of the Holocaust. Um, and as you say, it doesn't. The Holocaust doesn't come out of nowhere. The Holocaust summons all of us, certainly in the Western world, to a reckoning. And all of us in Christendom, if I may say, uh, it took place in the heart of Christendom in an enlightened Europe. Yes. Uh, and there, as you know, that that soil was prepared by centuries of of religious and philosophical forms of anti-Semitism. Um, and that's part of the, I think, the resistance. You know, we 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 like to think that uh, since the Enlightenment, we're all you know liberal and understanding and tolerant. And but what is not known is that almost without exception, the thinkers of the Enlightenment were anti-Semitic. Why? Because the Jews continue to buy into revealed truth, commandments from God, rather than being self-legislating and autonomous. Uh, this is also tilled in the soil of centuries of Lutheran and, and Catholic teachings yeah. against the Jews. Okay. Um, 
when we teach this in America, I mean, my student, it's very alien to my students because they never heard a sermon that ended with, now go get those Christ killers, the Jews. But that was very common in Europe, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we're summoned to a reckoning as Christians, as enlightened people, as, as the heirs to Western civilization, as human beings as human beings. And that's what, that's the challenge. That's why we shy away from it in many quarters. And I, I can understand because it's, it's some, the Holocaust is a, is a topic that any of us, Christian, secular, Jewish, any of us engages in fear and trembling. Yes. You bring up some profound statements and it, listening to you, hearing you make those statements, Dr. Patterson, makes me think about the prophet Obadiah when God told him that in the last days he would wipe out the descendants of Edom because they stood by while their brother Jacob <clears throat> was held in captivity and they did nothing. And yes. I think back to the Holocaust and the pogroms throughout history, Christian history, and I ask the question continually, where was the church? Where were the Christians? Why didn't they speak up? Why weren't there more? Because Yad Vashem has documented 23,000 righteous Gentiles. We know there's probably many more, but that's nothing compared to the 6 million that were slaughtered. In our yes. final closing moments, Dr. Patterson, is there anything else that a just, thought that came to mind or something that yeah, you want uh, to communicate. Last, I'm sorry. My last thought, my last thought is um, an expression of gratitude and admiration for you uh, for, for confronting this, for being a witness to this, for, to you as a Christian, because I know, and I, I have many Christian students and, and dear, dear, dear friends who agonize over this history, uh, who, uh, who in their ways are saved. I think they're saving Christianity. They're restoring Christianity and you know, the righteous that you invoke uh, among the Christians are also unsettling because they rob us all. They rob the rest of us of our excuses. Uh, so just, I, I just wanna thank you for inviting me here, for for engaging this Herculean task that you've engaged, and you know you set a you set an example for me as a Jew and my fellow Jews and your fellow Christians, and so just thank you. That's all. Thank you. Amen, <clears throat> Dr. Patterson. Thank you for your kind words. I'm humbled by them and. It's a great honor, especially coming from someone like you. Um, it's always enlightening to speak with you, and I am so grateful to have your participation on our program today. God bless you for your unrelenting work in defense of the memory of the six million men, women, and children who perished at the hands of an evil dictator. We owe you, sir, a debt of gratitude for your leadership on this topic. And ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the facts. As PJTN Watchmen, we have a biblical mandate to warn our brethren. God told the prophet Ezekiel, If you see the enemy advancing, and you fail to warn the inhabitants of the city, and innocent blood is shed, God will require that blood shed of you, because you are the watchman. You're standing on the wall. You're standing watch. You're listening. You're tuned in to this program. You're being informed. Now you know truth. Now you see what the enemy is doing. But if you, if you warn the inhabitants and they refuse to listen, if their blood is shed, God will require it of them, not of you. That's why silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a godly man who also struggled with this issue. He confronted it. He lived it. But in closing, we need for our watchmen 
to be paying attention to what's going on in your community. You are standing watch at the gates of your city, of your county, of your classrooms, of your children's education. This is so critically important, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot just turn our blind eye and say, it doesn't affect me like many Christians have done throughout the centuries before us. It does affect us. It does affect those who worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as I mentioned, God's going to hold us accountable. And that's why we're providing this program. We're providing the, the media content on our website so that you can be educated and you can share this information, not only with your children, especially those of you who um, have children, your, your kids are in the school system. These are things that they need to be taught because this is not being taught to their children. And that's why we make our media content on our website available for you to sit with your child, sit with your family, even your Bible study group, watch the programs, have a conversation afterwards, talk about these things. What will you do if you're forced to, to confront anti-Semitism in your school, in your child's school, or in your community? In closing, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to join us for next week's podcast as we continue this conversation. I've invited Haim Eisen. He's going to join us, and we're going to discuss our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren in Israel at this critical hour. So please remember, as a watchman, you can share this podcast with your family and friends to alert them as well. God bless you all, and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren, the state of Israel, and these United States. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Proclaiming Justice. Please share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information about how you can get involved, please visit our website at pjtn.org. As a PJTN watchman, you can help us keep up the fight to preserve our freedom for our children and their children for such a time as this.